In this reflection, I'd like to return to Robert Wright's book, The Moral Animal, to look at how our notions of evolution have been changed since the mid-1960s. Let's see what Wright has to say. Wright is careful to tell us that uh, language is a problem when talking about natural selection. He writes that he will sometimes write about natural selection as wanting or intending to do something. And he uses quotation marks around those two terms. Um, he wants us to understand that when we see these terms with quotation marks around them, that he's using them as metaphors and is not intending for us to take these terms literally. Natural selection has no desire or intent. That should be clear. Our author wants us to understand that natural selection doesn't consciously design organisms. It doesn't consciously do anything. It blindly pressures hereditary traits that happen to enhance survival and reproduction. Still, natural selection works as if it were consciously designing organisms. So pretending you're in charge of an organism's design is a legitimate way to figure out which tendencies evolution is likely to have ingrained in people and in other organisms. It's important to note that environments are always changing. They're unpredictable. Even environments for organisms that are well adapted by natural selection can change. Unpredictability by its nature then cannot be mastered. As John Tooby and Lita Cosmatis put it, natural selection cannot directly see an individual organism in its specific situation and cause behavior to be adaptively tailored. The best natural selection can do then is to give us adaptations in a general sense, so mental organs or mental modules that play the odds. Wright tells us that it was William Hamilton who was the first to see that selection was taking place not so much at the level of the individual or the level of the family as Darwin thought, but uh, in an important sense at the level of the gene. Hamilton then was the first to clearly sound the new central theme of the new Darwinian paradigm, and this was in 1963 and 1964. And that was looking at natural selection from the genes point of view. According to the new paradigm, the only potentially immortal organic entity then is the gene, or strictly speaking, the pattern of information encoded in the gene, since the physical gene itself will pass away after conveying the pattern through reproduction. So, in an evolutionary time frame, then, over hundreds or thousands or even millions of generations, the question isn't how animals fare. We all know the grim answer to that question. The question is rather how individual genes fare. Some will pass away and some will thrive. And which to which is a matter of consequence. As in the case of natural selection, it's important to note that genes are not clairvoyant or conscious. They don't try to do anything. But should a gene appear that happens to make its vehicle or its organism behave in ways which enhance the survival or reproductive prospects of itself or other organisms likely to carry a copy of the same gene, then the gene may survive over time. Wright tells us what matters here, and this is the Hamiltonian concept, is that there are some genes, and we'll call these altruistic genes, that uh, tend to improve the prospects of other vehicles or organisms that carry the same genes or copies of itself. So what matters is that the gene ultimately does more good than harm in the long run to its own proliferation. Remember that behavior always takes place amid uncertainty, the uncertainty of an ever-changing environment, and all natural selection can do here is play the odds. 
That said, it's important to note, according to Hamilton, that natural selection will, given the opportunity, actually improve the odds by minimizing uncertainty. Any gene that sharpens the precision with which altruism is channeled then will thrive. For example, Wright tells us, a gene that leads a chimpanzee to give two ounces of meat to a sibling will eventually prevail over a gene that leads it to give an ounce to a sibling and an ounce to an unrelated chimpanzee. Those genes that are conducive to the survival and reproduction or replication of themselves are the genes that win in the game of natural selection. They do this straightforwardly by prompting their vehicle or their organism to survive, um, beget offspring, and then equip the offspring for survival and reproduction. Or they may do this uh, circuitously um, by enhancing the uh, prospects for survival and reproduction of distantly related, um, genetically related individuals. Naturally, it's the level of the organism that is of primary interest to us as individual human beings, but it is of secondary importance to natural selection. If there is a sense in which natural selection cares about anything at all, it certainly isn't us as individuals. It's about the information in our sex cells, our eggs, and our sperm. Of course, natural selection wants us to behave in certain ways, but so long as we comply, it doesn't care whether we are made happy or sad in the process, or whether we get physically mangled or whether we die. The only thing natural selection wants to keep in good shape is the information in our genes, and it will countenance any suffering on our part that serves that purpose. This was the philosophical importance of the simple point that Hamilton made in the skeletal sense in a 1963 letter to the American naturalist. Hamilton gave flesh to that observation the next year in his paper entitled The Genetical Evolution of Social Behavior in the Journal of Theoretical Biology. And this paper, after going much unappreciated for years and years, has become one of the most cited works in the history of Darwinian thought and has revolutionized the mathematics of evolutionary biology. The Hamiltonian the mathematics for inclusive fitness contain a potent symbol, R, which represents the degree of relatedness among individual organisms. Among full siblings, R is equal to one half. Among half siblings, nieces and nephews and aunts and uncles, R is equal to one quarter. And among first cousins, R is equal to one-eighth. The new math says genes for sacrificial behavior will thrive so long as the cost of the altruist in terms of the impact on its future reproductive success is less than the benefit of the recipient in terms of the future on its reproductive success times the degree of relatedness between the two. When an R is equal to 1, altruism is ultimate, and Wright provides us with an analogy or metaphor to illustrate Hamilton's notion in an interesting way by looking at a human being, which is a single organism consisting of many trillions of genetically identical and cooperating cells. Wright tells us that at some point in our evolutionary journey, uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of years ago, multicellular life arose and societies of cells became so highly integrated so as to qualify for the title of a single organism as we think about organisms today. And it is these organisms in an ancestral sense that begot us. When you look at it, it's important to think about yourself as a collection of many, many, many cells, even though you are an individual. And almost all of these cells in the human body are sterile. Only the sex cells um, get to make copies of themselves for posterity. 
that the trillions of other sterile cells in our body act as if they were perfectly content with this arrangement, uh, doubtless is grounded on the fact that the R between these cells and the sex cells or germ cells is 1. Genes in the sterile cells are transmitted to future generations just as assuredly via the sperm or the egg as they would be if their own particular cellular vehicles were doing this transmitting of the hereditary material.